Well, we can get started for today. Um, call the meeting to order at 6.02 p.m. Um, first step is to review and approve the agenda. So I did um, forget one thing on the agenda. I don't, you know, we can amend it or we can talk about it next month too, uh, because it's not like it's something that's going to happen overnight, but I had dug up everything on the Davis Foster overlook and I was hoping to <laughs> talk about that tonight. But like I said, that's, you know, that's a project that's going to take a little bit and we already have good information on it. So we can either add it tonight or we can just put it off till next month. It looks like this meeting is going to be pretty short. So if you want to talk about it um, and add that this meeting um, as part um, <coughs> B3 of the staff report. So we'll say Hiller moved to amend agenda. So we'll add it to the staff report. Oh, yep, there's my cat scratching at the door. <sighs> and then um, I also wanted to add I to the so agenda. The Thank you, Dan. Um, Do we need a second or is it okay to have Jamie move? Jamie's looking to something else real quick. Yeah, I was going to ask, I don't know what sections okay. would be in um, questions about the burn on um, Davis Foster. Um, if that would be under the staff report. Um, yes. Or old business, but adding that. Oh, I thought I had that on the agenda. I didn't. Ah, <laughs> well, apparently I just left Davis Foster completely off. Uh, yeah, that's supposed to be on the agenda. So I and I had it originally under old business. Okay, that works if, perfectly. Okay. Geez, I'm so sorry about that, guys. Okay, and should we add it as item C? Uh, yeah, we can do that as C. Those were only are my only additions. If anyone wants to move to approve or um, would like to challenge any of those additions. I will move to approve the agenda with the two additions. It looks like Mark is seconding. That is right. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Um, we have the motions. Um, all in favor, raise your hand. We have unanimous. Okay. So moving into introductions. Yay. Yay. I know. I'm excited for this. Okay. All right, so um, <clears throat> we have with us tonight uh, two new, very exciting additions. Um, so our first introduction is going to be Rebecca Fisher. Uh, she started last Thursday um, on the 8th, and she is the new stewardship intern. And she already has one, uh, one workday and one uh, training under her belt. So started off strong, um, but I will have uh, Rebecca, if you could just uh, tell us a moment about yourself, uh, maybe a little bit about how you got here and uh, just introduce yourself. Sure, I'm a junior at Michigan State University. I'm studying environmental biology slash zoology um, with a minor in sustainable natural resource park management. 
Um, I found out about this position. Emma was a guest speaker in one of my classes and she mentioned the position and I applied and I was offered the position. So I'm actually from the Milford area, but we'll be staying in the Howell area this summer um, with some extended family. Yeah, and so Rebecca's background is actually in zoology um, and she works at Kensington Parks um, with Metro Parks. Uh, so she has a lot of really great experience with the public, which is why we wanted to hire her. She had incredible responses and um, that definitely showed this weekend at the workday and the training. Um, she was very comfortable and I didn't have to do anything <laughs> to watch over her. Uh, she just jumped right in. Um, so I'm really looking forward to you know, this next year with her. It's great. You know, you know, my friend, Mike Broughton then probably. Oh yeah. Yep. Mike and I met about five years ago and still have a great working relationship. He's over at the nature center and I'm at the farm center. Oh, great. Does anyone have any questions for Rebecca before we go to our next introduction? Um, so next we have Kendra, and I'm not sure how to say your last name, Kendra. Grzeski. Grzeski. Okay, I'm glad that I had you say it first. <laughs> um, so Kendra is our um, Environmental Commission representative. So she just got, she was just um, um, placed on the Environmental Commission, I think, last month so you've been to one of their meetings and then you know of course she she showed interest in the land preservation program she's actually I've been working with her on some really cool wetland education with Leroy Harvey already this year um, so Kendra why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself Good evening, everyone. I'm uh, excited to be with you this evening. Um, I've been involved actually with Environmental Commission for oh, maybe eight months or so or longer. Um, I got involved because of wetland advocacy um, and I worked with Emma, Leroy and Cliff Wells on um, creating a wetland brochure. Um, so I'm very involved in um, wetland advocacy protection. Um, I love um, all kinds of environments and being outside and um, we have native plants, um, 327 we planted last year. Um, and I've been to the, I'm doing the vernal pool training and um, I've been a part of um, Emma's invasive trainings. Um, I'm just very involved in the environment and advocating for it. And um, it is my hope um, that I know that there's a lot of folks um, uh, departments at the township in addition to um, uh, commissions that touch the wetlands and I feel like there's some communication gaps um, and so I'm hoping to work together with everybody and hopefully we can um, work on addressing some of those issues um, and uh, I look forward to working with you. I don't really, I, I don't know you really, I know I know I've worked with Emma, I've been working with Emma since I think what October of last year anyways on the mm -hmm. wetland year. Yep. Um, and uh, I've seen some of you via trainings and it's super exciting and fun, I must say. Um, I'm really grateful to be part of it. Um, professionally, I'm a clinical social worker with 25 years of experience providing psychotherapy. Um, I'm an advocate um, uh, for the environment and also for diversity, um, equity, and inclusion. So I'm excited to be here. In I was gonna say before we move on, why don't we um, everyone take a moment to just do a brief introduction and um, you know, we're really excited to have both you guys, Kendra and Rebecca joining us. Um, I can get started. My name's Jamie. I'm the chair for the board. Um, this is my second term um, with the Land Preservation Advisory Board. Um, and then in my day to day, I work for MSUFCU. You want me to go next with the next to you? I think I'm. I am on your screen. I'm my screen anyway. <laughs> I'm I'm Mark Stevens. I coordinate Project Fish for Michigan State University's Department of Fisheries and Wildlife. I'm the liaison to the Park Commission. Uh, I've been on the Park Commission for about 16 years now, and I think I've been on this commission for about eight or ten, something like that. 
Um, but I uh, enjoy doing this kind of stuff. And I love wetlands. I used to do a program called Wonders of Wetlands and did workshops for teachers and stuff like that. So um, I'm, I'm a strong advocate for that as well, Kendra. So, uh, but yeah, that's me. Welcome. I will go third. Uh, welcome, Kendra, and welcome, uh, Rebecca. It's wonderful to have you guys with us. Uh, my name is Dan Opsmer. I'm a uh, township trustee in my second term and uh, serving in my first term on the Land Preservation Advisory Board as the board liaison. And in my day job, I work at the state capitol and am the chief of staff to state rep Julie Brixey. And I'll turn it over for someone else to. I can go next. I'm Chris. Um, I could go. Oh. Um, I'm a new board member. I think I just joined in November, so I'm still learning about everything. Um, I've been to multiple of the work days, and um, I just enjoy being outside and uh, trying to restore things to their natural habitat. And that's about all I have to say. Yeah. Um, I'm Steve Thomas. Uh, welcome, Kendra and Rebecca. Also, <clears throat> I'm wearing a mustache disguise. It is a sticker. Um, that's what my daughter said. It looks like a sticker. <laughs> um, I, uh, I'm in my second year on the Land Preservation Advisory Board. And uh, I've been doing stewardship in the township for a number of years um, and trying to help work to get uh, the stewardship activities and the preserves kind of, um, you know, ramped up a little bit and Emma's, you know, pushing that a lot and it's really great. Um, and by uh, trade, I'm an ecologist. I work for a consulting company. Uh, I can go next. Uh, so my name is Yuman Lee, and I, I met Rebecca <laughs> on Saturday, right? Um, and then uh, Kendra, if you took the Vernal Pool training, <laughs> then you probably already have heard me talk and know who I am. And so, but um, yeah, this is my second. Um, just started my second term on the Land Preservation Advisory Board, and um, yeah, during. My day job, I work for uh, Michigan Natural Futures Inventory as a zoologist and herpetologist. And I also, yeah, love wetlands. So <laughs> welcome. Hi, I'm Chanel. I graduated um, a little over a year ago and I joined the board in November. Um, I work at a multidisciplinary design firm, but my background is landscape architecture and horticulture. So I've gotten to work in wetlands and doing like wetland surveys, but um, since we're talking about wetlands so much, <laughs> but um, I just love the environment and I like actually contributing to the community instead of just like talking about it. So that's why I got involved and um, I'm really impressed with the work the board does. So welcome guys. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for introducing yourselves and getting a sense of who all of you are. It's very exciting. Yeah, and you both know who I am now. <laughs> all right. Well, I'm very excited to have you both on board. Um, it's going to be a, a great year of stewardship. And it's funny, I just did a wetland promo, while well, they're calling it a promo video for home TV today. Uh, so I had my wetland brochure that we made <laughs> and uh, it was great. They asked a lot of great questions. How, you know, what can residents do to protect wetlands? Why are they important? Um, so definitely when that's done, I will send that on to all of you. Uh, I've got a lot of interviews with interns. They must have just hired a bunch over there. <laughs> so yeah, so that'll be great. Awesome. 
Um, well, we can move to the next portion of our agenda, which is approving February's minutes. Um, pull that. Does anyone have any um, changes, updates to last meeting's agenda from February? Mark, you are muted. If there's nothing, I uh, uh, move to place on file these minutes. I'll second. Awesome. All right. Um, if there are no changes, we have a motion. Um, all in favor, raise your hand. Our eyes, raise your hand. Keep your hand down for days. Unanimous. Okay. Um, were there any communications? Mm, not that I can think of. Um, we are, we did interviews today for a new administrative assistant in our department, and we're really looking forward to getting someone in there to um, help. <laughs> so that's very exciting. And we had uh, two uh, really incredible candidates. So I don't know if that counts as a communication, but I know the Parks Department is very excited about this. We miss Robin tremendously and we're very sad, but we're very happy that she is deputy clerk. That's a wonderful promotion for her and she's gonna do an incredible job. So, yeah. It did look like there was another attachment in your email, the 2021 financial support of the stewardship network. Was that? Yes, yeah, so that oh, I put that's that under, under new business. I, Perfect. I, you know, I'm still kind of getting used to this. So if anything seems like it's in the wrong place, please let me know. And, and you know, but I, I figured that could go under um, new business. Awesome. I'm bouncing between uh, having the agenda on my phone so I can see all your <laughs> pages um, between attachments. So I just wanted to double check where that was. Awesome. So no communications. We can move on to old business and start with the room renaming of properties. Yeah, so, um, you know, this isn't something that is, is going to be able to be decided tonight by any means. Um, but we definitely have some clear front runners between, um, you know, you guys, the board and also I had the Parks Department um, vote, which uh, not all of them have gotten their submissions in yet. Um, and I know that, you know, they, they'll want to know how that comes out as well. But uh, we do have some clear front runners. Um, you know, I don't know, I can share, I, well, I don't know if this is something I need to share my screen for right now, or, you know, I can just kind of type out the list. I mean, some of them clearly have one name that we really love, that everyone really loves. Um, and there's one, I think it's Central Meridian Uplands. There's a tie between three. Um, so I'm definitely gonna have to type these up and we're gonna have to have more discussion uh, about you know, where we wanna go from there. Um, but I'm really happy. I used uh, Umana, I used Survey123 for it because I'm apparently just using that for everything now. Um, but it makes a nice graph for all the results. Uh, so you know, basically how I'm gonna do that is I really want the parks staff to be able to um, have their full say to, and then what I'll do is I'll bring that final list. And I think then, you know, I don't know exactly how it works, but I'm assuming we can make a motion to approve those new names. And for some of the tiebreakers, you know, I think I didn't have, a, I don't know if I had everyone's submission. And I know I don't have like, you know, Luann, and I haven't talked about it yet. So I think 
you know, possibly we could get some input there, but I think people are really excited about it. And we'll be talking about signage soon. So as soon as we approve those names, which we'll do at the next meeting, um, we'll get the little plaques. You know, I, I don't know how many of you have been out to the Thai Heart Preserve, but you know, the Lynn family sign, that's essentially what we are going to be doing for the name plaques. Just so that, you know, if anything happens to them, we can replace them, you know, if they start to get old, if something breaks, or I guess you never know. I mean, look at Foster Davis and <laughs> we call it Davis Foster and it says Foster Davis on the sign. So, you know, there's things that could come up. We want to be able to replace it easily. And um, I think Jane did let me know that she believes that Thai Heart does need to stay as Thai Heart. I, I don't know. I think she said it was a board decision when they acquired it. I'm not 100% sure on that whole process, but I, but you know, as far as Thai Heart goes, most people wanted to keep it as that anyway because it's very directional. You know, it's it's very easy to find because it's right on Thai Heart Road. Um, but yeah, I can share this with all of you. I believe I can share all this data, these graphs with you so that everyone can kind of see. Um, yeah, so does anyone have any questions about that process or thoughts? Sorry, are you going to share that now or are you going to share that once you've compiled all of them? I can share it now. It doesn't have every every single person's submission um, between the Parks Department and the board, um, but I can certainly, I think I can share it right now. I don't know if that would generate questions or thoughts, but. <laughs> Hmm. Okay, yeah, I can share it right now. Would everyone prefer, because what I was thinking is I would just email it really quick so that everyone, because otherwise I'd have to scroll through my screen for you to see all of it. No, Whatever is easier. Okay, I'm just going to save it as a PDF and share it right now. Awesome. Okay. Yeah, I'm glad to see that. Um, I mean, I know, you know, a lot of the parks, like the grounds crew staff, like kind of Katie Adams department, I think they really like to be directional names. But I think a lot of us also really liked the cr more creative uh, kind of land feature names. Okay. Okay, I just sent it. Oh, nope, it didn't go through. Okay, I'm just gonna start a brand new message. Also, I, um, you know, we're starting to think about our, while I'm doing this right now, I might as well talk about this. Um, we're starting to, I think, you know, they've kind of struggled for a while doing rule signage. There's a lot of mock-ups of the rule signage that I have found in the files. Um, I don't know, is everyone uh, familiar with the Red Cedar Glen sign? Yeah, I think I know what it is, yeah. That's one of the only rural signage signs that we have at the yeah. preserves. And I, I, I really like that one. Okay. We, we used to have that same thing at one time at uh, Sylvan Glen. Um, is that is that red cedar that's, Glen? yep that's red yeah. cedar Glen. yeah yep. that's that's the way we 
Yeah, and uh, that's the one that um, they used to have a bunch of rules posted on the board, just kind of nailed up there, and they changed them often. But it, that that I would suggest doing something like that sign there, because uh, that that's a nice looking sign. Yeah, I I agree, Mark. I think that sign is is really nice looking. I think it's concise. It goes over everything. Um, it's different than the park signs. You know, I think that's something we really want to think about is, um, and that's been a big topic. That's actually something we're going to talk about tonight. It's just, um, you know, some of our preserves that are really highly used. And I did send the email, so look out for that. Um, some of our preserves that are more highly used, I think some of the residents, even some of our staff are concerned that it's just kind of morphing a little more into a park. So when I do signage, I wanna make sure that we differentiate. You know, we already have different signs for labeling it as a land preserve, but I just wanna make sure that our rule signage is very clear, you know, about the fact that it is a preserve. It, it's a different form of recreation, you know, recreation is allowed, you know, we want people out there. I think Jane brought up a really good point too of, you know, her and I were talking a lot about this and at the preserves where it looks like there's not a lot of care into it or like maybe we don't care. It seems like that's the places where people are using it however they want to or kind of willy nilly. And, you know, we don't want to bring too many people in like it is a park in a way you know we don't want to bring in a ton of recreation to the preserves but we also need people to understand that us as a township that we really care about these places we want to take care of them we do want to maintain them to a certain extent um so those are just some thoughts that we have going forward with signage and talking about rules and I'm excited to get it up there though because right now <laughs> It's really hard to enforce anything when there's there's not rules up there. I think something that might help with that as well, um, some of the signs, the older ones say natural area instead of land preserve, um, which matches some of the park language as well. So if you're not looking at a map, it, and you just see the natural area sign, it can be hard to distinguish if that's a preserve or a park because some of the older signs use that same verbiage on them. Yeah, so those really big signs are, you know, they're obviously pretty expensive, but there are a couple preserve, like Foster Krause's sign. It, I think that was our first sign that we put up is what Jane, you know, has told me. Um, but yeah, it's really old. <laughs> it's like about to fall over. So, you know, our focus is rule signage this year, but there are a few big land preserve signs that we need to replace or give some love to. And I, I don't remember if that one says natural area, but I think that's something we definitely want to look for. Or, you know, we can even, it's not the most attractive thing, but if we don't want to buy a bunch of big signs in one year, if we do see ones that say natural area, we can always cover it with a board that has wood burning in it if we really feel like we want to, you know, distinguish that now but yeah I don't know if everyone is able to get that file yeah I got the email a question is it okay to okay. ask um so uh one of the things I participate in is every Wednesday morning we have this dialogue meeting um where we talk about environmental topics and one of the things that got brought up and I'm not sure if it got brought to your attention Emma is um, a preserve over like by the Coles and MSU, FCU area. Um, some, someone lives in the neighborhood around there is complaining about like trash getting into the wetland preserve and wondering if it's coming from Coles, MSU, neighbors, Granger, I don't know, but um, you know, so I think helpful, be helpful to have people understand that these are preserves, these are kind of rules around it and it helps people pay attention and care more about and paying attention to those kinds of things, um, pollution and stuff. Are you aware of what I'm talking about, Emma? So yeah, I, and I haven't been able to be a part of the dialogue. It's just, we did interviews all day today. It's been pretty busy the last few weeks, but um, I did get a call from that gentleman myself. And um, I think when I looked at the map and where he was talking about, the only problem is, and 
you know, I want to lend as much help to them as I can, but I don't believe like to me, I'm not seeing that it's affecting actually one of our preserves. It's, it's just IDE's property or it's also property from the association. So of course, you know, of course I, I want to make the whole township much cleaner. And I think it's a great um, platform. And I think it's something, you know, I mean, I kind of did an outreach with the cleanup crew this for Earth Month of, you know, people getting out and picking up trash and reporting it to, to me so that we can keep track of that. But I do think, um, you know, the only preserve we have over there is the Newman Equities Preserve, which is across the street. So yes, I did hear about that. But I do agree completely with what you're saying. I think um, it seems like in the past we've kind of walked this line of, you know, the preserves, we really want them to just be natural areas. Um, we don't really necessarily want a lot of recreating on there or trails, um, which is great. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm all for having natural areas just for the nature and we absolutely want the majority of that preserve to be that but the thing is is they are ultimately owned by everyone who pays taxes and there's going to be public out there there's there's going to be people out there using them so we have to you know find some kind of line where we're letting it be natural but we're taking enough care in it that we're teaching people to recreate responsibly and so kind of my goal it's definitely a weird line to walk but So I, I'm wondering um, what it, are we going to be sort of just discussing that the the increase in signage here? Are we going to like are we going to have a role of agreeing or uh, voting on signage or no? Or is it just sort of a for our information? I don't um, really know how it works. Yeah, I'm right there with you too. I, you know, th like I said, this is a very new process for me as well. But I think um, I really would love input from the board. I really value everyone's opinion on the board a lot. And um, so that's kind of why too I'm bringing it up now because I know it's going to be a big thing for us this year. It's a big goal of ours. And so I kind of just, you know, if you're out by Sylvan Glen area, if you're at Red Cedar Natural Area, you know, take some time to check out the sign there. And I'm, of course, going to have pictures of everything. Um, the next meeting is, the next meeting's agenda is really based around signage um, and just some improvements at the preserves. So we're going to be talking a lot about that in the next uh, several months. So yeah, it, you know, I'm just kind of putting on your radar right now. Um, I think it, you know, if we already do have a sign out there at one of the preserves, it it might it would be nice to try to make it as much like that other sign as possible. But I don't want us to just go with that sign just because it's already there. Uh, I do think it is a very good one, and I think it has all the information that we really want. But I think yeah, I I do think I'm glad you're bringing it up. <clears throat> Um, for us to start thinking about it, because I, I th do think this is really important. I, I sense that we're at a kind of a, a pivot point a little bit, and it might be partly because of the pandemic, but um, the, the trail, the number of people out there and the way people are using these preserves has just ballooned. Um, you know, it starts, things that were a foot trail are now basic all like ATV trails. Um, and I'm seeing, you know, sometimes it's after a snowfall and I see where people are riding their bikes and it's way off trail. It's not even on a, you know, they've gone off a trail that wasn't even a bike trail. And then they're just going through the woods on, you know, big fat tire bikes and things like that. Um, and, you know, hundreds and hundreds of dogs, <laughs> you know, and on and off leashes, all you know, all kinds of things going on, and and, and often of right, there are no signs, and so it's yeah, oh yeah, yeah. every yeah. all kinds of stuff, yeah, people parking, you know, all kinds of places. Um, it, I do think it's important because 
you let things go for a long time and people start to feel like the, their rights going to be their rights are being taken away if you tell them they can't do something they've been doing for two years already. Yeah, you know, hundred percent. Yeah, the sooner sooner we have signs out there, the better. Absolutely, and that's why there's just this huge push, um, not just from not just me. You know, Jane and Lou have been wanting to really see this, and they, you know, that all started as I was coming in too. Kelsey was really developing a lot on that, so we have a good foundation to go off of. And um, I totally agree. I think, you know, because that's the thing, that's the gray area with the preserves is this, the parks do have a lot of signage, you know, about dog walking. And, you know, we know that people don't listen to those, but, you know, if we don't have it up, they just think it's a random kind of piece of land. And so we really, uh, yeah, we really need to set our expectations there. So, in fact, when we were at our Trailblazers work day, you know, we did have somebody confront us about that and about dogs and, you know, they, cause they had a property that butted up to the preserve and they didn't even want us to be working on the trail because they want, they don't want anybody on the preserve because they just have a bunch of dogs off leash in their yard, which of course every resident can do a lot of their own management to mitigate those things. But regardless, um, you know, we are seeing that people are kind of using it the way they want to. So I had a question that I think you kind of brought up the answer to Emma, but um, do we have an inventory of all the signs? I think you said you might start taking photos or something because that'd be great to have like for the next meeting or the one after to start looking yeah. at the severity or, or all that stuff. Yeah. Yep. So that's all, that's something I've been working on. So that's all slated for next agenda. I figured we'd kind of get more into that as it warms up. And we're also going to start meeting at the preserves starting next month. So, you know, we're really going to kind of get out, get to get out there and see for ourselves. That's why I want us, you know, meeting out there as much as we can when the weather's nice so that we can all see for ourselves, you know, what's going on. So yeah, absolutely. We'll, we'll kind of go through what we have and what we'd like to see. Awesome. Well, if we aren't going to be um, voting on any of the names for the um, thing and everyone has a chance to be able to review the entries that have been, has everyone received that um, PDF Emma just sent? Um, do we want to move forward to the, um, speaking of trails, the um, final decision for the bike trail at Foster Crops? Yeah, so I know this one has been a long time coming, which is why I threw it on the agenda for tonight, because I know we talked at length about it before, and I think it's kind of coming to the time where, you know, we we... You know, to my to my knowledge, and when I looked back at the notes, what we had talked about was trying to meet in the middle. And um, I think some of us, I think we were very split on, you know, do we really want to open this up for bikes? Um, do we want to, you know, kind of advertise the trail as more of a passageway and say, you know, walk your bikes through? Cause you know, we, re we really do want to take into consideration the safety of the community. You know, we want to have an opportunity for them to, you know, which right now they can already make that choice to walk their bike through, but you know, we're not really setting it up that way. We don't have anything out there saying no bikes. Can you please walk your bike? This is a sensitive area. Um, so I think at this point we just need to say do we want to allow bike riding or not? And then from there, we can, you know, I can create some education to go out there about, you know, this is a safe, <laughs> you know, we can come up with something that is more catchy or more just something at the front that says, you know, please don't ride your bike, but, you know, we want you to be able to pass through safely. Something. To that can extent. you review first? Because I, I don't think I was in on the meeting about this part. Can you review a little bit yeah. like why you would not want people to ride bikes? Yes. Yeah. So um, base, uh, and I don't have, I don't have access to my shared 
file here and I really should have had maps. I apologize, everyone. I feel unprepared at this meeting tonight um, because I'd like to be able to show you a map of Foster Krause. Um, so I don't know if you're aware of that preserve, but do you know North Meridian Road Park? Actually, I can look this up on the township website. Yeah, I was just going to do that. Um, so let me pull it up here. So if, is, if, it, if, is it called North Meridian Park or is it yes. Eastgate or something? Nope. So that or, it's close. Is, it's close to Eastgate and Eastgate is part of Riverfront and there's there's bikes allowed all along there. So bikes are allowed in any of our parks. Um, our preserves, on the other hand, have a different set of rules and bikes are not allowed on preserves. So I'm gonna um, look this up for you here. If you, if you guys are not aware, the GIS mapping on the township website is really an awesome thing. All right, I'm gonna share my screen. Make sure I share the right thing. Okay, can everyone see that map? Yes. Okay. So here is North Meridian Road Park and it is on Meridian Road. Oh. And, you know, it's like this big rectangle. And then we've got, oh, why is it not? Oops, okay. Sorry guys, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> so we have North Meridian Road Park here which bikes are allowed on, and that's great. You can bike your little heart out there. And then we've got Newman Road that runs through here. We've got all these little neighborhoods, uh, Buttercup Lane, there's a bunch of little neighborhoods right here where there's you know kids and they like to ride their bikes to North Meridian Road Park. So here is Foster Krause. So Foster Krause is this little preserve. It completes North Meridian Road Park. They're totally connected, which of course creates an issue when we have completely different sets of rules for preserves and parks and they're connected. So we had a community member come to us and well, actually he called me to see if we could build a boardwalk over a wet area. And then he found out through us talking that bikes aren't actually allowed on Foster Krause. And so this started a whole conversation um, about safety and he came to a board meeting and he's really been pushing for us to um, allow bikes on Foster Krause Preserve because otherwise, you know, kids or people who are riding their bikes, they travel down Newman Road and then they travel down Meridian Road, which are both, you know, pretty fast roads. Meridian is, Road is quite busy. And then they travel down here to get to North Meridian Road Park. I don't believe there's sidewalks there either on those roads. There's not. Yeah, and, that's an issue there. Yeah. And so, you know, of course, of course we can just, we can also relate to the community and this gentleman, you know, we are absolutely allowed to use Foster Krause as a passageway, you know, you can walk your bikes to North Meridian Road Park. Um, but, you know, I think the thing was, I think this community just really wanted a connection to North Meridian Road. And I think there are a lot of kids in that neighborhood who really enjoy riding their bikes and they probably ride their bikes anyway, even if, right. even if they did know it wasn't allowed. Um, so that, you know, we, we basically, you know, the community came to us asking this question. Um, now, Foster Krause is, as you can kind of see from this map, it's a wet area. It's next to a wetland. So the trail basically, you know, it starts right here at the road. It goes through here and then it goes like this. So the thing is, is with biking, you know, there's quite a few months out of the year where if you're a responsible mountain biker, you're not out on the trails because if you can see tire tracks, if you can see footprints, it's, you're not supposed to ride your bike on trails. So, you know, the, the, if we do allow bikes here, first off, it opens up for, okay, while well, we're allowing bikes on this preserve, why not let bikes on other preserves? And, you know, two, are we going to be possibly damaging this area more if we allow bikes here? But at the same time, 
are bikes already happening in that preserve? Yes. So we have a lot of things to think about. You know, we have the land preservation to think of. We, you know, this, it's not super highly sensitive. There, there are a lot of, there's nice native ferns. There are, you know, a lot of ferns that we're seeing out there. When we did trail work this weekend, I was actually pleasantly surprised to see quite a few native plants popping up under the honeysuckle we removed. There was some, you know, different buttercups, um, just a variety of, of little flowers coming up. But it's not, you know, it's not one of our most pristine areas, but again, you know, what do, what do we do um, with this consideration? So it's um, been something we've been discussing for quite a while. Emma, um, I, I have, I, I live in the area. <laughs> so I have to say that I'm not really sure how many kids there are really around here. It seems like there's a lot of, um, you know, retired folks and maybe grandkids perhaps. I don't know how many kids. And I would wonder if a lot of the kids are maybe coming um, from over uh, east of Marine Road. Um, because I'm not aware, you know, part of the neighborhood watch, I'm not aware of it being heavily, you know, we walk these roads a lot. We don't see a lot of kids and we don't see a lot of bikes. Um, so I'm not sure where those they're coming from. I mean, there might be some for sure. So the gentleman we talked to, uh, you know, he, they're a family. And so the house right here as well, the parcel that's right next to Foster Kraus is a family they have kids. So these uh, two residents, and so this uh, other resident lives down Buttercup Lane over here. Um, they are the two biggest proponents and they do happen to have families and kids. Um, but you know, that's also the thing in this type of work, we're not gonna be able to always please everyone. Um, we also have to think of the community as a whole we also have to think about the natural community. Yeah, Mark. Um, yeah, we do have this precedent already set with Red Cedar Glen is that we allow bikes in there. Um, and, and because it connects to a biked property, you know, um, in Leg Park, um, it might be that we, because they are connected, that we take consideration of that. It's hard to stop somebody riding a bike through an area and then all of a sudden, boom, there's a sign that says no bikes allowed. Um, so, you know, I, I'm, I'm not in favor of, you know, destroying that park at all or that, uh, that preservation land by having people be able to drive bikes through there all the time, riding them. Uh, it is a wet area. It is, you know, that's a pretty small trail when we were walking through there. I, it would be it's hard tight. to ride a bike. It'd be hard to ride a bike in some of that, <laughs> some of that area. So I, I think maybe um, doing a walking, you know, beyond this point, walked bikes only or something like that. Beyond this point, walk bikes only, you know, sign or coming coming into it maybe walk from this point forward or something like that. I don't, I don't know, but, but yeah, the but... they can't bring their bikes through there is they're going to anyway. I well, think... and I think that's, I, I really, I think you brought up a lot of good points and that's kind of what we discussed last time too, is um, because it is a connector and, and we know that there's, I mean, just to be frank and real, you know, it doesn't matter if we put up a sign that says no bikes. We we know what's going to happen anyway. Yeah. Or the um, sign's going to come down, and you'll have to replace it <laughs> by some angry, right? Uh, angry little gang of kids. No, um, but yeah. So can we? So you know, do we just decide? You know, no, we don't want. You know, we want to we want to stay closer to our original preserve rule, but we can put up signage that says sensitive area, please walk your bike from here. Um, and just hope for the best, you know, because sure. that, that's really what we do with all of our signage. We, we can't possibly be out everywhere all the time monitoring. And so we revert to signage and we hope for the best. And so 
Based on what you're saying, like if the guy is calling you and asking you for this boardwalk, so then if you say bikes are allowed in that area to get to this other park, then is that going to, you know, this guy is then going to push to have these boardwalks to cover the wet area. And, you know, like, so then that's more money and work towards something that you didn't originally want to begin with. And I know I talk a lot about turtles, but you got your turtles too, that they could injure those when they're right. I love turtles. You can never <laughs> talk about them enough. <laughs> um, yeah. And that's a great point. Um, I think once we, you know, once I, my attention was turned to Froster Krause and we did go out there, I think, you know, Chris, we did realize it might, you know, we, I think we all came to the consensus that it would be nice to put a minimal boardwalk out there just for walkers, because the problem is, is that when it is wet, which, you know, this year it's been really dry, but when it is wet, people widen the heck out of that trail. And that's the other thing that we're like, okay, at this point, doesn't matter if we're allowing bikes or not, a boardwalk seems in order. So now the flip side of this too is, you know, when I talk to these two families, a big part of my thing was, well, you know, if we're going to work together on this or if we're allowing passage of bikes, um, you know, the big thing with me and bikes, and I'm a mountain biker, so I understand. I love mountain biking, but it's a huge vector for invasive species, for seeds. Um, it can be very destructive. Uh, and so, you know, what is your role going to be in stewardship? And, and that's something I'm trying to do on all the parks right now. I've actually gotten in touch with Therese, Teresa Delisle um, to work with the bike groups around the township to really start getting that stewardship cemented into their recreation because they can be a really big part in spreading invasives and eroding trails. So, you know, of course there is a potential partnership there if we can work together. Um, we did go do a, we did do a work day this past Saturday and we really opened it up, you know, just taking invasives, nothing else. And, um, so that's kind of the crossroads we're at. Well, he, he, one of the things is he's willing to do the work as well. Um, so it wouldn't be cost on us to maintain it. It would be something that he and his group was, would be interested in not yeah. only doing the work, but also paying for, you know, um, the, the offer. <laughs> yeah, he um, offered to, to really help out big time with the boardwalk. And, and, and honestly, him and I have not been in contact in quite a while. Mm -hmm. um, but he's also kind of been <laughs> uh, waiting for an answer too. And, mm -hmm. you know, so I, I, of course, let him know we'd get back when, when, we, when we hit that answer. But yeah, you know, I, it's, the, bike, the bike trail kind of uh, idea of moving invasives around. I mean, you still have, you have vibram souls that people walk and they walk through areas that bikes don't go and may pick up seeds. And, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I don't think that that's an issue um, because I think there's invasives that come in on people's clothing all the time or in their mm -hmm. boots or their hiking boots, or especially mm -hmm. if they're the ones going to check out the pond and going off trail to check out the pond and then coming back mm -hmm. onto the trail. You know, so I, I wouldn't blame the bikes for that. Um, <laughs> well, I'm not completely <laughs> blaming them, Mark, but if you don't wash your bike tires every time sure. and you go to three parks in a day, you're sure. covering way more miles than another person, than a person potentially on foot. So, so so it's not totally blaming them but it's, it's great information to be able to give them to take you know to clean right. their tires and stuff like that so um but it's people should also do that with their boots and their, you know and their pants and things too so absolutely 100 percent. and and that's the other side of it is you know it allowances do always offer an educational opportunity mm -hmm. there's do a we? lot of things <laughs> Um, so moving forward with this, do we want to have a three option vote? So we can go through um, in a roll call um, and you can either say no bikes at all, walking bikes only, allowing people to ride bikes. And that way we can kind of narrow down to see where everyone's at and then further to the discussion if it needs to be narrowed down further.
So I, I, I have think a, that's I have a great a, idea. I, I so I have a question about related to that, and I I I like that idea, except that I think how I would vote would depend on um, if we're going to do something about like a boardwalk on the trail. So I guess I wasn't sure. Do we? Are we definitely doing the boardwalk regardless? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I All think right. we need to just because I've seen a lot of, and that's a great question. I, I have seen a lot of destruction on the side of the trails. Like the year before was a very yet, yet it was a very wet year, and I think it's needed for sure. Okay. Okay. The then that makes me though, feel better. Yeah. Well, the question though, you man, is a good one because will he, if we say no bikes allowed, will he want to help with? the boardwalk and then that puts the expense on us instead of on them and the work on us instead of on them so, or even if or even I think if that's walked. okay though i think yeah. that's okay though yeah. i'm okay with taking on that expense <laughs> it won't be big it, it yeah. we're talking about a really uh minimal small area yeah yeah because we don't even want to you know because i think we really talked about too that the water passes through there and so we need to be careful with how we do put yeah. anything through there so yeah so just so you know, from my perspective with funds, I am really happy to to go ahead with that, you know, personally. And I believe the area for the boardwalk was like, I'm very bad at judging distance. I think it was no more than 10 or 12 feet. So it's not a very, very long boardwalk. We're not going to be doing a boardwalk from the beginning of the park to or the preserve to the end. It was just a very, very short wet section where the trail got too close to the wetland. I was going to say, isn't the whole trail kind of faulty? <laughs> Just kidding. Sorry. <laughs> well, no, I, you're so right. I, it's a short set. It is a short section. And I, and I didn't, I did not, and you know, fortunately make it out there when you guys went out there. So um, is the rest of the trail able to support people walking bikes on it? I think so. I think so. Um, okay. I think it's quite stable and you know where I was showing that map right where that wetland kind of curves around that's the area where it and, and I do believe it gets lower right there as well as a continuation of that kind of lowland area um so I I really think the rest of the trail is is really solid and especially I mean this year it's hard to judge because everything is it's really dry mm -hmm. I think it's more feasible to walk your bike through there and safer than to ride it because there's a lot of low hanging area that you kind of duck under when you're walking. So I can imagine, you know, losing your head, headless horseman kind of <laughs> people out there. And then there'd be stories and stuff. Maybe that's kind of cool. Maybe we need to have that. No. <laughs> yeah, we have like I'm some, kidding. Some <laughs> folklore and stuff we can develop, you know? All right. Um, so do we want to go ahead with the roll call vote? Um, so you, the three options are allow for riding bikes, walking bikes only, no bikes at all. Which one do you want to start with? Um, so we'll just go through the, um, each person by name and I can try to record op the options um, and just say which one you want. That way we can narrow down if we're all in agreement, we want some level of bike riding or bikes allowed, you know, we can go from there or um, we can just narrow down from three to two um, to right. for the discussion. And I can record two there. Oh, perfect. So say Mark, if you want to start. Well, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm for walking bikes through. Okay, Chris? Walking bikes. Steve? Um, I would accept walking bikes or no no bikes. Um, and if we did no bikes, I think we'd have to work with them for another way to get to that park. You, man? Uh, I'm for, um, I'm okay with walking bikes through. Janelle? Walking bikes. Kendra? I'm, I'm gonna abstain from voting. I don't feel like I know enough because I don't know the, I don't know it well enough, and I'm too new. So, um, I think there's a lot of things to consider um, if it's wetlands or not, like part of the code or not. So, sounds like you guys are all kind of on the same page anyway. So, I don't think you need me. 
I was on for walking bikes as well. And it sounds like th that was pretty much everyone's at least relative comfort zone option. Dan. Um, Dan. Oh, did like he, he had, leave? He dropped out of the meeting. Oh, um, he might be back. <laughs> okay. I can't see everyone because <laughs> my screen is split. So sorry. <laughs> Okay, yeah, and so far it has been everyone walking bikes only. So do we, I mean, do we now do something more final since everyone came to that conclusion or? Well, I would make a motion to make that happen. Walking okay, bikes right. only, do we make a decision on this, you know, and then talk with the, the bike folks and the trail people and maybe get some signs made up for that. So are you saying you made the motion? Yeah, I'll make a motion to. I'll second. Um, and then um, I don't believe we need to do a roll call. We can just do unanimous voting. Um, if voting aye, raise your hand. Voting nay, keep your hand down. Okay, it looks like Oops. everyone voting aye. Perfect. Who no, seconded the motion? Is there expenditure? I did, Chris. Uh, Chris okay. did. Thank yeah. you. Is there an expenditure? Did we, we didn't vote on any expenditure, but we didn't talk about the boardwalk. Do we need to do that? Do we need to uh, vote to make the boardwalk happen and spend any money it might make to do that? Um, like up to $500 or I don't know how much it would cost to do that. Yeah, I don't know either. I figure manpower, man time and all that stuff. If, right. if the person doesn't want to do that any longer, um, because yeah. you're only doing walking through, but there's going to need some communication there with that, with the, uh, the guy that brought that to our attention. Right. What about, a, what about going forth with approaching that <clears throat> that neighbor first and discussing our our view with him or our vote with him and, and seeing where he wants to go then if he finds that acceptable. Uh, also another point are I think this is going to require wetland permitting township probably right and or state just is it three quarter acre more it is more than three quarter isn't it yeah probably or goes to a stream or something like that so yeah so and then in the meantime too what I can do is I can properly measure the area and we can at least get an idea of what the price would look at and I can come up with some you know mock-ups of or just ideas of what you know I think we had originally discussed uh just doing you know basically some type of boards this way and then just doing, you know, kind of like a plank board across those. I think we wanted to keep it really simple when we originally talked about it, but I can um, definitely do some digging on all that. Yeah. I would recommend, you know, checking out to see what the ordinances are, you know, related to that before you have any communication with that person. It's just so to set the expectation um, so there's not maybe potential frustration. Um, well, and he was a, he's a state worker and he does work for the DEQ or Eagle. Yeah, he works for Eagle now, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and I, I know we had discussed permitting and such last year when we were there. Um, and I can always look back at those minutes too. I believe we discussed um, because of the amount of wetland it would cover that there were certain materials we were not allowed to use or certain construction um, types. Um, so it might be really good also to just review those to make sure that we're um, being within the rules about you know what style we're building in, we're using proper materials. All right, well, I'm really happy to at least get that part of that decision made. That's 
We've been talking about that for a while, so that's great. Okay. And then I believe the next section is it in old business part C discussing um, Davis Foster. Yes. So we're going to talk about the, I'm going to give you a burn update, which I know I had a version of this document that had this information. So I'm really wondering what happened here. Um, okay. So, you know, I'm not sure if everyone's aware of how the burn went at Davis Foster or Foster Davis. <laughs> I'm so confused now. Um, so we were originally burning four acres um, of the, you know, the oak strip and the wetland that runs along the east side of Van Atta, or east side, yeah. Um, and that went very successfully. Um, and it did get to the end of that burn. And that is, um, when we had the burn jump the break. So uh, this was Saturday, April 3rd. Um, you know, we had, it was windy that day, but we did have, um, you know, the okay from our fire inspector at the township and everything was going really beautifully. And it uh, hit a conifer at the end that kind of went up really quickly and then an ember went into the prairie which at that point because it's been such a dry season it's been incredibly dry um you know there were some different factors that went into this but you know ultimately you know everyone needs to understand that protocol was completely followed everyone did their best on that day and um, no structures were harmed, no people were harmed or injured. Um, the fire departments and PlantWise responded very quickly and very well, and nothing got outside of the preserve that I'm aware of. You know, when you look at it from an aerial, it definitely looks a little intense. I think it ended up being about 40 acres. So that being said, um, you know, it's it's a hundred percent not the outcome we want to see. You know, prescribed burns are already a, a very delicate matter. Um, you know, e ecologists and environmentalists have been working very hard for a long time to make sure that everyone understands the ecological benefits. You know, a lot of our ecosystems are failing because we're suppressing fire so much. Um, and so it, it's really a blow to that end of everything. It's, it's not great image wise. Um, ecologically, uh, the, the prairie is gonna come back great this year. Um, it's a fire dependent ecosystem. You know, we burn it on a cycle. Um, it's already greening up. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, I mean, it, literally three days after I went out there, it was, it was, there was green shooting up. Yeah, we just got home. So I did, we like, and we just saw the postcard that like, call if you want, um, you know, snow when, or, you know, let us know if you want to be called when they're going to burn. Um, so they were, the original part was the east part of Foster Davis. Yeah, so. Um, because I, I was surprised at how big it was because I was thinking yeah. the west part, right? It's on the east side of the road, but the west or the west part of the east side of the road, correct? Let me, um, because, um, yeah, let me pull up the, the very close to that area. So I, yes, uh, I know you and Chris <laughs> live very close. And honestly, I, I think the neighbors over there are very used to the burn cycles uh, because we really, we didn't get any calls. We got one call. I'm about because I, I'm just saying like the average person might not have known how much you were going to burn. Like, yes. Even and we, though and we did board, include that in the letter too. So, you know, we did say we're going to burn four acres, but you know, are people looking that close? I don't know. Yeah. Um, but I mean, like even I, I thought it was a small area and then I was like, wow, that's a lot. And I was like, maybe I got mixed up and I'm on the board, you know, so maybe people like, I wouldn't worry too much about 
I don't know. I know there was the one year that it jumped and people definitely knew my dentist knew that it jumped <laughs> and almost whatever. Well, I um, can tell you that I've talked to people that whose houses were, you know, had on the other end of it, you know, so it, we, the wind was coming from the South Southwest that day. We weren't at risk, but the folks that were, um, you know, are, um, they are in support. The ones I talked to of, of, you know, burning for invasives, but I'm wondering about getting more safeguards in place. Um, apparently this is not the first time it jumped in some sort of way and had more acres burn. So is there a way to, you know, whoever makes the call, but then also to have lots of safeguards in place so we don't lose the support of the community to do th these projects? Yeah, so that's the next part I'm getting to here. Um, I'm sharing my Meridian screen. Township Again. is really so. Meridian Township. I mean, you have to have those fire trucks out there and stuff. They're really strict. So versus a lot of other communities. So, I mean, in some ways, it's a lot safer than than other places would be. So yeah, and that's yeah. I, I and so that's kind of why I'm starting out here saying. Um, that everyone responded exactly how they should have. Everyone did exactly what they should have. Um, you know, and I think it, it wasn't as windy that morning, definitely picked up. And, and you know, Tavis admitted that when it did, but that was towards the end of the burn. And that's the thing, they were almost done. So if you look, this is where, this is where the original burn took place here. Uh, this is a really, awesome little wetland right here with lots of native wetland flowers. There's oaks through here. So yeah, this, this all went can you, beautifully. Can you give us direction like um, north and south type thing? Yeah, so this is north, wait, right. I'm not great with direction. Um, this is north, no. No, north yeah, is because this is the this, east side. Because yeah. is that the barn up there? Or yeah, what, so what this is the barn. So this is north, yeah. east, south. Okay. Okay. So yeah, this is the barn up here. And so when it jumped, well, it, so a conifer caught over here, the amber went up. And so really the thing too is it, and we've gotten some flack about keeping up those burn breaks all year round because our, our poor grounds crew is just, they have 90 miles of pathway to maintain all summer long. So for us to ask them to mow all these burn breaks in here is a lot. But I think that was also, you know, when you, when you look at the burn from an aerial point of view, it really mostly stayed within those. Of course, there, there's a, of course we had a burn break along the edge here, but the problem is, is that the ember floated up and over um, and so, you know, basically this area that I'm outlining got burned. You know, it, it really spared this area over here near the barn, um, but all of this is burned. So, you know, what we've really talked a lot about, uh, David and I had a debriefing, Tavis and I had a debriefing, and we went out to the preserve together, um, is that, you know, Davis Foster, it's happened here before, this is a very individual situation out at this preserve. It's much windier out here. Um, there's a lot of fuel and our, our spring was really dry, but again, you know, two seasons ago it caught. So we really want to, you know, moving forward, we wanna look at Davis Foster very individually for our future burns. And, you know, we're almost, we're basically gonna to have to have our own set of rules for this preserve. Um, because there's just a lot of factors that go into it being kind of unpredictable and wild card, you know. Um, you know, Tavis has discussed that he, he'd like to come up with his, you know, a township policy for weather conditions um, to be able to draw a hard line, you know, and he's not looking to do anything extreme. I mean, when they put a burn ban in place for recreational burning, the wind speeds can't be you know, they put in the burn ban once it hits 10 miles per hour. So he's not talking about those kind of policies that we, we, you know, put out there for recreational burning because, you know, we don't know who's, 
making bonfires and what yahoos are out there. Um, so, you know, not anything that conservative, but he's doing a lot of research and a lot of work and he's working with fire contractors to come up with something where he, where he can look at it because, you know, he did, he did tell me that um, it's a hard decision sometimes and, and they have a lot on the line, you know, though all those, those people do. So um, me and him are working very closely to do that. And from here on out, you know, he kind of told me that, that we've never really needed to have a ton of communication between the stewardship coordinator and the fire department. Um, you know, they're always there for the burns. They're always prepared. But, you know, him and I had this discussion of we, we are now having pre-burn planning meetings, every single burn. It doesn't matter if it's four acres, 30 acres. Um, you know, it's just, it's, it's a good step forward with more intensive communication you know, which can be, of course, more work, but, you know, this is a good step in the direction of us all being much more on the same page and um, really understanding this preserve and all the factors that go into burning it in the future. I didn't see, I didn't see a lot of uh, negative stuff uh, about the burn on next door, you know, next door, those, I think Jim Harding, post yeah. a shot from his house which was pretty close to his house but he was very much in favor of burns and everything but it was just the you know the idea that the wind did pick up it was a little bit windier than most but then you had folks that were very um supportive of that not calling him out on it but just kind of saying you know you know up to 15 miles an hour it says you know it, but anyway they it seemed like they were very knowledgeable and, but everybody is very positive about it. It's just Good. keeping in mind that, you know, we need to be conscious about if the wind does come up, you know, what do you do kind of thing. So I'm yeah. always in favor of more areas being burned anyway, because that saves us some money there. You know, we did we have we already burnt we hadn't already burned that area and that was part of the plan later on. So we got more for what we, you know. Well, like a $50,000 burn right there. Yeah. So I think living here and talking, I spoke with Jim. I had a lengthy phone call with, with Jim him. Hardy. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, he is in support of the burn, but, you know, putting more safeguards in place because sure. I can tell you in living here in particular that, you know, we just had a fire like three weeks prior to that. And there yeah. was about six fire departments that I counted going down the road for about a three hour time frame, you know? So um, it was scarier for those folks that live over there. And, and, and the fire did go um, north of the barn, you know, yet still yes. too. It, 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 it burned a lot of area and I'm glad that it's, you know, um, growing back and stuff like that. But I think if we can consider um, whatever formula you want to put together, you know, with the fire chief, you know, without, you know, not, winds not over a certain number mile an hour or whatever, having extra, you know, trucks on hand or whatever you need on hand to get that under control pretty quickly. I think people would be in support of that. Yeah, or absolutely. maybe, a, or maybe even I've seen some of them do a pre brush hog the site. Um, where, you know, it's knocked everything down, it's brush hogged, and then it, it burns a lot lower um, and, and faster um, than, than having taller stuff that possibly could get lifted in the wind and taken away. But these guys do this professionally. So, you know, yeah. is this the same guy that lost it the last time? Um, this was plant wise. Um, and I, um, I do believe that it was who we used before. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I mean, again, like I said before, it's, it's really unfortunate. It's really unfortunate for David Mendel too, because, right. you know, it's, I mean, they don't want to see that. And I think kind of like you were saying, you know, yeah, these guys are the professionals. And so there's also a certain amount of trust that the fire department puts in that and they put in themselves too you know these are people who deal with fire on a daily basis and but really you know it comes down to at the end of the, at the end of it there's there's still things that can be you know out of people's control and there's still um, unknowns and there's still things we can improve on you know so there's there's a whole lot of 
feedback that we got from both David and Tavis. And I really appreciate their openness and, you know, just them owning anything that happened. And also just the fact that it was, it just kind of came out of nowhere. It was right at the end of the burn and it, it just wasn't expected because of how well everything was going and how close it was to being done. So I, it's just very unfortunate um, from that standpoint. And, and I was, Kendra, I was totally thinking of the fact that there was just a wildfire out there recently. And I just felt, now that's why I really expected more people to reach out. Um, but I really, yeah, I think moving forward, um, it's just gonna open up more opportunities for us to really dig into these sites individually and you know, what they need specifically. Now we got, we have, we have two jumps under our belt. You know, we, we can learn from this, we can move forward from this and, and it can be really positive. You know, luckily nobody or nothing was hurt. So we can move on from this positively really quickly, just like the prairie after the burn, you know, we'll, we'll uh, grow quickly from this. So there's been a lot of burns with no issues so I mean I guess that's something to remember too you know right they, they've and done I, it numerous times exactly and I think that's the thing too that you know Tavis and I were talking about is you know even when we think of this policy or we think of the conditions for burning you know because they look at what the DNR puts out they put out that it might be a high risk day for burning but then the DNR professionals are still burning that day around the state because they're professionals and you know they really know those limits and and they they know what they're doing um so that's the other part of it is you know we have to have policy for the township and the community as a whole on burning um but you know we also are going to have our own set for prescribed burning and we're gonna you know be able to have totally different um rules and standards and yeah, you're right. There's been a lot of very successful burns, but of course, you know, I think it's like you need eight positive things for every one negative. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, it's true. It has, you know, there's been positive things. And I would even say, you know, I'm super grateful to all the fire departments that came on board and, and, and so there wasn't any damage, you know, and I, and I like that, you know, okay, so something went wrong. Okay. Now let's problem solve it and figure out what to do to avoid it in the future. So, um, you know, I really appreciate that. Yeah, they came in full force. It, it really looked, I mean, it was, it wasn't great, but they, they came in so much, you know, they have to call in so much more than they, they really even need because they just want to make sure that the, the actual bad outcome doesn't happen. So that's the other thing too. We see, we see departments from 10, 12 different counties, but they're, they're making sure that it doesn't go a step farther. I had a quick interjection too because I observed um, the burn. Uh, I talked to some people on the street that were just like biking by and they even like while it was all happening after like it was supposed to go well, like the part that did go well, even they were still like in support of it because um, I was just talking to them um, and that they were like, yeah, maybe there's more safeguards like we're talking about right now. And I was wondering just like in my own thoughts, is it ever possible to have like someone from the department, like the fire department with a, like a water tank in case, or does that cost money? Or like, it, I was like surprised that the fire department didn't have like a policy that they would just like, I don't know, I'm new to all this, so. Yeah, it's interesting too, because when Tavis was talking about that, they have little control, they call them Indian, ta Indian tanks or Indian water cans, I think. Um, but they have all those in their trucks and they're just very small scale control because usually they just have to, you know, uh, do, do that small control. But, you know, Tavis was when he was the first one that came up to the, the fire that had broke out in the prairie. And when he asked David what he should have done in that situation, it was completely against everything that Tavis has ever been taught, which was basically to start another backfire to push it a certain way. So these are great discussions that are opening up between the fire contractors and the fire department of, you know, because the fire department is used to putting fires out, but they're not super familiar with prescribed burning necessarily. I mean, they seem very similar, but they're very different. Um, so mm -hmm. there's just a lot um, 
of great discussion that can happen from this. And I've already been looking into to going through some trainings uh, for fire management. And I think um, Luann, she's really in support of that, just to have another person at the table who understands a little part of it, you know, so. Yeah, that's a good thought. I, I can, I, I, you, you guys, Emma, I think you've, you've done a great synopsis of these issues and um, Thanks. all these good comments. I was there as well. Um, I will say so like a few comments from me. It was very frustrating overall that that happened because the, the burn as they conducted it was one of the most boring burns I've ever seen because they were so incredibly cautious. And I really mean that they were going so slow. Um, it was taking like twice as long, which it, so um, they had great control where they had the fire and they were doing it very, very slowly. But there was sort of a perfect storm with this little spruce tree that it, <clears throat> it was not even a native tree, so to speak, you know, probably grown from blown in from a residential property. And so there was sitting this one tree. Um, and I didn't, I'd been on a lot of fires in past lives of mine and I've seen a lot and I didn't even recognize this as a, as a hazard, which like not as a serious hazard anyway, the tree was quite far from any other uh, available fuels um, at that point. And yet the, um, the way the tree burned and the speed and, and it threw up one ember um, and it did, it threw an ember into really the most flammable spot in the township probably, um, which is this, you know, this hilly planted grassland and we don't really have others of those, but there it was, that wasn't even the target of the burn. Um, but once that area was, you know, by, by this chance event, uh, ignited that could not be put out, you know, in the direct sense, um, except at the far perimeters with backburns and such. So it was the whole thing was it was frustrating that 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 kind of confluence of events occurred, and I didn't even you know I learned a lot from what I saw. You know, unfortunately, um, I didn't even I didn't even see ahead to what was about to happen. Um, so I, I think it's great that there's going to be the idea of having people communicate more. If I had even recognized that as the hazard that it was, I would have said, hey, you guys, make sure that tree's cut down. Yeah. You know, and then that wouldn't have happened. Just that one little thing. It wasn't even a huge tree. It was, you know, 18 feet tall. Yeah, I'm very so. thankful to both you, Steve, and Chanel for being my eyes and ears that day because I had a couple different events going on that morning and I had already cleared, you know, you guys don't need me there. And so I was really, really thankful to have two people on the board and great volunteers too, by the way, <laughs> um, to really communicate to me as well what they saw and what they observed. So I got several accounts and everybody's lined up too. That's the, the other good thing. So will we, um, cause I know we've been burning um, everything on a cycle. And I think that those sections were supposed to be coming up in the next year or two. Will we then mm -hmm. push those back further a couple of years before we burn those again? Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, I just, that's just my initial thought off the top of my head um, because we have them split up into four burn units. So we burn them. We burn one each year, so they're each on a four-year cycle. Is that what that would be then? Yeah. So, you know, we burned one. We burned one in 2019, and then we didn't burn last year, and then we were going to burn one this year. So, you know, essentially, a lot of a lot of those units were burned this year. So I don't foresee them being burned any sooner than what their normal cycle would be. And I think we were even talking about burning that those areas even less than they are right now. So, you know, we'll kind of see going, going on out from here. 
Have any additional comments for the um, burn that happened? Hearing none, can move on to new business and the preserve trail maintenance trail blazer program. Okay, so we already, we really, you know, kind of touched on this a lot with Foster Krause and we don't have to, um, you know, dwell on this too much, um, but, you know, I just want us to be all be on the same page, um, Luann, Jane, and Katie, because, you know, Katie Adams is in charge of the grounds crew who does all of the trail maintenance and maintenance in the parks and in the preserves, but, you know, we have kind of more of a line with the preserves where they, they don't really do much out there unless there's a tree down or we ask them to go do maintenance. Um, so, you know, I started this trailblazer program through the MCC and we had it kind of got put um, a little bit under the microscope because we were just kind of all talking about, you know, what does trailblazing mean within the preservation program? Um, you know, because we're, we're the preserves, um, there's no new trail creation in the preserves. Um, we just maintain the one trail in and out right now for public use. Um, but when we acquired all the preserves, you know, it was kind of set in stone that we don't want to be creating a bunch of trails throughout. Um, we don't want to do any maintenance outside of the trail. Um, at least for recreational use, that sort of thing. So I just wanted to, um, you know, say going forward, um, you know, in my mind, uh, like we talked about when a preserve looks unused and it looks abandoned and it doesn't look cared for, we have a lot of misuse. And so we want to start um, showing more love to those areas um, with our volunteers, with our volunteer program, because there's a lot of people in the MCC who are really excited to get out in those areas, learn more about them, um, learn more about the plants and wildlife that live there. And, you know, we want people to be able to use those trails responsibly. And again, like we talked about, if they're too narrow, if they're too wet, if they're too this or that, then we have people a lot of time going off trail, widening trails, you know, all that great stuff. And of course we are gonna have people who just go off trail anyway. And, you know, there's really nothing we can do about that. Um, but, you know, we just wanna all be on the same page as far as we're not trying to create uh, new trails because we, we have had some residents, like when we were at Foster Krause, you know, we had a resident, a neighbor approach us who was not happy about the trail maintenance. Um, just really wants those areas not used by the public. Um, and there was a question of, well, these are land preserves. Are you even supposed to be doing maintenance or you know, aren't they supposed to just be natural areas? Um, so, you know, we are developing this volunteer program to mainly remove invasive species. So we're not coming into these areas trying to completely change it um, or turn it upside down. When we worked in foster crops, we only removed, I mean, I think there was one sapling that we moved because it was in the middle of the trail, uh, but everything else was invasive species that were just totally overcrowding. They're dropping berries, people are stepping through it. Um, you know, those are, those invasive species, I'm gonna remove them regardless of whether they're next to a trail or not because that's part of our management plan. You know, we're trying to make more room for native species, remove invasive species. So, you know, just going forward, I just wanna make sure that, you know, everyone on the board is aware um, that we're not trying to, to turn these places into parks or high recreation areas. We're really just trying to get the community more involved so that they can care about these places and so that they can themselves take better care of them. Um, and maybe when they see someone riding a bike on the preserve, they might say something. Or if they see a dog off leash running through spring ephemerals and tearing everything up, um, they might say something. 
so uh, you know we're we're not trying to rework the you know the the preservation ordinance we're really just maintaining that one trail and we and i have had a lot of other residents too ask me if we can create trails in different preserves and you know we're we're trying to meet in the middle um with some of those people as well and get them on board um, with our programs and start to recreate responsibly. So I just know there's been a lot of discussion about that in our department. There's been discussion from residents. Um, so I just wanted to get everyone on the same page and of course open up for any input that anyone has. I think the other question too quick that I wanna throw out there is, um, well, not question really, but if anybody has thoughts on this, um, I think there's a concern too that if we start maintaining areas with volunteers that um, you know, we might have to, um, you know, how do we kind of keep up that maintenance and that sort of thing? Um, so I just, you know, Wanted to know if anybody had thoughts on how the trails are used at the preserves. Um, anything that we'd like to see more of, less of. I don't know how much time you spend out there, but I, I mean, I'm at the preserves a lot, so. Um, I was under the um, impression when camp coming in, you know, the no building new trails, um, kind of like with Foster Krause, um, you know, if there are situations where there are previous existing trails that could use like boardwalk type maintenance, um, to help protect the surrounding area, I think personally, I am okay with that. Um, because ultimately while we are doing trail maintenance, um, it ultimately benefits the surrounding areas. Trails aren't being widened. People aren't going off trail. Um, but, you know, don't think that we should be continuing to add trails, um, in. Yeah, I personally think if the goal is just to remove invasive species and that's all you're doing, then it's all good. I think, like, if in some case removing so many invasives along the trail causes it to widen, then maybe, like, is there some kind of, like, seed bank of natives that we can try to facilitate that growth. I'm not sure what the best practices are on that, but like if you're just removing invasives and that's the mission statement of that whole program, you know, I, I love it. I, I think it's nice if people can walk on the property because I think, you know, like if people in a community, it gives them a place to go to and then they feel ownership of that property and then maybe they care about it. I mean, I think it's all a positive thing. I mean, I, I don't think we should add trails, but right, if there's right. if there's trails or walking space, I think I think that's a good thing. I like how you said ownership because when Jane and Lou and I have been talking about this, that's the word we kept coming to because you know ultimately the taxpayers all own a small piece of that preserve, and so I think it is important for people to get out there and feel that ownership. Um, yeah, and the ordinance is tight with not creating trails. So I don't think that's gonna be an issue at all. <laughs> well, I, one of the things that I'm thinking about when you're talking about creating trails is if you have to um, redirect a trail around yes. something, there's a trail there already and it's just getting over use or too close to something where we'd have to redirect you know i'd be in favor of that kind of thing you know it's a catch-22 more people in the parks means that there's going to be more support for the parks but then there's also going to be more people in the parks so or in the preserves i mean you know whatever you want to call them park I, or either way. right I, I think it is in the i'm pretty sure i'm like 99.9 percent .9 sure that it says in the ordinance that the only time we will add trails is if it is to reroute or redirect around a sensitive area and um uh 
shoot. I forgot what I was going to say. Oh, in some, some preserves, like there's a forest grove, which is a wetland. It, as to my knowledge, it doesn't have any trails in it. Um, nobody really goes in there. It's really nice once you get in there through the buckthorn. Places like that, we, we're happy with how they are. We don't, we don't want to add any accessibility in that form. Um, but like some of these places that there's already a lot, you know, there's already trails made through them and people are kind of using them how they want to. I think that that's definitely where we're focusing. I think was part of the, um, you know, the existing trails that we have with the preserves, um, you know, we've been talking a lot about signage after we review, you know, budgets, maybe not for this year or next year, but upcoming years, maybe providing more educational signage throughout, especially at the beginning, so that people understand that there's a difference between just a regular park. You know, there is a purpose for having walkways through here and the actions that are being done. Um, but it also, you know, as, as Mark said, um, I think maybe it's Chanel, um, you know, the ownership, I get all asked all the time, well, what does the preserves do for me? You know, am I allowed on there? Um, and I think some people don't necessarily know. Um, so being able to have some of that educational signage for areas that do have trails could be helpful. I, I, I did have a great question idea. about that is, it, you know, Emma, you bring up a good point about, you know, there are some areas that are absolutely beautiful when you get into them. Um, what's the rule? I mean, if somebody wants to put on hip boots and walk through a wet area, does, is that against the ordinance? I mean, it's not a trail. They can walk through that area. Um, Public is welcome anytime, as far as I know, anywhere. anywhere. <laughs> no so, off, you're off the trail. There is no trail here. So, you know, I don't know if people know that or if we want people to even know that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, and I think, you know, I, in, in basically every nature center or county entity that I've worked at, and that, that's kind of the consensus is enjoy this area, but stay on the trail. And, um, you know, of course we want that. We want to protect everything outside the trail. But I think that's kind of where I come to, Mark, every time is there's nothing that says people can't be out there whenever and wherever they want to be. So, yeah, there's some really cool stuff to see that's not the trail. Yeah, like, for sure. Near the trail, most of the time people pick or they crush or they you know, something that happens to it. And then, you know, but if you get some hip boots on and go explore wetland, you're seeing some really cool stuff that you may not see from the trail. So yeah, I'm one of those, do we allow that or do we promote that or, you know? Yeah, I think so far we've all kind of been like, we have a lot of good promotion at a lot of the preserves. So let's nurture that and let's just kind of stay Let's just kind of let the other places be as they are until something comes up. <laughs> well, in plus we're, we are already so busy with what we've got going on. So I think there's that too, of course. All right. Do we want to move forward to the 2021 financial support of the stewardship network? Is, is this the same boilerplate stuff that we do each year, like $5,000 yep. to uh, the Stewardship Network in Lansing area? Have, has our relationship with them changed at all? I mean, we used to use them a lot, you know, um, and, and, and I don't think we have for the last few years. I don't see a lot of work by them lately, but that's because Leslie's kind of gone and, you know... Nick was working with them a lot, but, but I, I don't know. Does that so, change? Yeah, so Ian and I have connected on a couple different things uh, lately. Um, it took us a little bit to kind of reach out to each other and really get on the same level. But, you know, because that's the other thing. I know they've changed management a couple different times. People have been kind of flopped around. New people have come in. Um, but I think now that people are in their positions, 
and we've kind of made this connection. Um, you know, we do a lot of work out at our conservation easement at Lake Lansing North. And I think when I view this relationship too, and also because I worked for Ingham County, um, I think it's valuable because there's not, you know, Ingham County doesn't have a preservation millage. They are not, um, like we are very lucky to have the funds we do to be able to do the stewardship work that we'd like to um, and prioritize. And I think, um, you know, we're, we're much luckier than a lot of organizations in that way. And so I do think that there is also a, you know, I think there's a little bit of a money and a time restraint for them more so than me. But I, you know, Ian and I have talked a lot about how we can work together because we're going to, you know, I'm going to be out there working anyway. And we are, you know, working with MSU classes right now to do some surveys in the burn area, some oak surveys, oak sapling surveys. Um, and so we're, we're really starting that conversation to, to move forward and continue to do some work. Um, you know, we've, we've been working together to do the Lake Lansing North uh, prescribed burn um, on that conservation easement. Um, so it might not be exactly what it was before. I mean, cause you know, Leslie Kuhn was like 10 people. <laughs> um, so I think it, you know, that it's probably a different dynamic than what you've seen, but I do think there's a lot of room to partner on a lot of, on a lot of really good stewardship projects. And I think also Lake Lansing North is such a valuable natural resource in this area. I think it's, that's my two cents. Is that the, is that the only thing that you partner with is, is that preserve Lake Lansing North or are there others? I know when Leslie was here, we were actually using some of the, her resources for some, some small, some of our, like uh, doing some um, Phragmites control in some of our parks. She was doing in parks and natural areas. Um, and we, you know, that, I think we gave them $5,000. Is that what it was? The, so the that's, years? yeah. And then so that that's, looking at again? yes. Yeah, so, so what we are talking about here is, and so yes, that, that work does run over into helping treat a ton of Phragmites in our township, um, which is, really great because there's a lot of Phragmites that's kind of outside of my reach, that's not in the parks and preserves, that the stewardship network, the mid-Michigan um, cl stewardship cluster, that they do treat a lot of that. And I've been in contact with, um, oh my gosh, I'm completely blanking on her name right now, Laura. <sighs> I can't believe I'm forgetting her name right now. Um, but she works with Jim Hewitt uh, really closely uh, on Lori Kaufman. Lori yes, Kaufman. yes, yes, Lori Kaufman. Thank you so much. I don't know why that slipped. Um, so yeah, they they do have you know they do treat a lot of Phragmites around the township, and so twenty five hundred goes you know directly to the stewardship network to support their work, and then twenty five hundred goes to the Mid Michigan Stewardship Cluster, which also um, goes to Friends of Ingham County Parks to do improvements and, um, you know, conservation um, improvements and uh, invasive species. I, I really believe that most of it does go to Phragmites treatment from what I've seen in the past work that they've done. Because um, we, we all know that Lake Lansing North is a, is a hot spot for, or just that whole area is a hot spot for Phragmites. Did they get rid of all the Phragmites at Lake Lansing North or do you know? I mean, I just saw some in the wetland out there, so I don't. There's not there's a lot more in there. There's there's a lot. This the Phragmites is a, is a big problem in the township that we could, you know, this is important because there are little spots that are easy to control. That just having this kind of coordination, you know, um, it is the only thing that makes sense. Um, because these plants are moving, they don't know what boundaries of what. They're just moving around from place to place. 
Um, mm -hmm. And all the kind of all these partnerships, the whole stewardship network, the whole theme is um, helping people do what they do more together than they could do alone, really. Um, and that's right. that's a huge thing. And I mean, that's a huge thing in the whole state and, and beyond. I mean, I think it's it's worth supporting even if we don't understand how it directly like pays for something right here in a preserve in all cases is it's it's helping um it's helping uphold a network of people and activities that we need to be successful like we need we need them and they need us yeah, I think it's a great collaborative effort and we're really going to be stepping up our Phragmites treatment throughout the township this year and moving forward too. Um, we're trying to get that township, I'm in communication right now to get that township wide permit um, so that we can kind of just treat where we see it um, within our bounds. And then we can also uh, push, not push, but um, get residents more on board because they don't have to pay for a permit then at least. So that part of the cost is covered. So yeah, I think Phragmites is a huge, huge issue that we all need to be on board with um, controlling. So, so Steve, do you think that the allocation between the stewardship network in Ann Arbor and of getting 2,500 and the mid-Michigan cluster to get 2,500 or would it be best if we gave more money to the mid-Michigan cluster, would that be helpful? We had this discussion 10 or 12 years ago about, we used to just give $5,000 to the Ann Arbor cluster. And I mean, Ann Arbor group. And then, you know, we were like, well, the mid-Michigan cluster could probably be more beneficial to us if, you know, if we, if we gave them, so we, that's when we split it in half. And I don't, should we relook at that allocation? I, I don't know. It's yeah. I don't know. You guys work with yeah. more with them than I do. For yeah, sure. that's interesting. It's it's a good question, I think. And I don't. I mean, I don't really know. I I think if if there is time and this is important enough, um, we could we could inquire with Lori Kaufman, Jim Hewitt, um, Lisa Brush of the Stewardship Network, and et cetera, and just say, here's the amount of money we're thinking of donating to these causes you know what what do you think of more or less you know people always are gonna say they want more of course we know sure. that but um you know is what if what if we doubled that amount and actually could get a handle on phragmites twice as fast in this township or something i don't know like i don't have a great sense right now of the money versus the effect but it's, I think it's, that's I think that's a great point, both Mark and Steve. And um, you know, there's there's no reason we can't, you know, put this to the side for right now and have some discussions with all those people, um, Lori Kaufman and Jim Hewitt. And I think that could give us some better insight because personally I I don't know that. And I think it wouldn't take too much you know we we have those contacts we know those people um it wouldn't it wouldn't take too much but a conversation with them to make us feel a little more um solid of, of the money we're giving out and and is it you know what's going to benefit this area the most and help out the people who are doing the work the most what well, well i think originally we gave the $5,000 to the Ann Arbor group with Lisa Brush, I think. I, I don't know if she was the executive director at that time or not, but they were establishing themselves at that time. So they needed more money. I think I, after all these years and you know the support that they've gotten, it might be good to say, okay, we'll give you $1,000 and we'll put 4,000 in the Mid -Mich Michigan cluster and support more yeah. here. I, it, it just, if that, I like the idea of having conversations with those folks and uh, seeing what, where our allocation, or Steve, like you said, maybe we increase it to, you know, 5,000 to 2,000 or something like that, you know, but, but yeah, I don't know how they do their money stuff, so. 
I quickly wanted to interject too. I'm not sure how much money like the Ann Arbor area would be donate, like how much they would be getting um, versus like the central, like Lansing. I don't know what they're all called, but it might just be like that. It, we would have more of an impact just money wise to the, this area than Ann Arbor. They might get a lot more, which is what you guys have already said, but right. um, I like the, like maybe a lesser amount to Ann Arbor and, and more here just based on who's donating where. Yeah, and even if they needed any more, I don't even know if they needed. It. it was just when they were establishing themselves. So, you know, Lisa would probably say, "Yeah." I was yeah. going to say, "Just say yes." <laughs> <I'm sure. laughs> well, I'm I, sure. yeah. anybody that lives off of soft money will say yes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> always need money. <laughs> I think that's the thing too. Is is in the end to anywhere we put it, it's it's going to be needed. It's going to put to good use. But I do really like this conversation of revisiting. And, you know, talking to Jim and Lori and Lisa and just, you know, there's nothing wrong with us wanting to impact more of this area right here. And, you know, I'm glad we're talking about this because, you know, this is a lot, this is stuff that gets put on my desk, like, okay, let's put this on the agenda. This, we do this every year. So I'm glad we're having this discussion. Awesome. Does someone want to make a motion to table this then for our next meeting after some further discussions then some conversations with Jim and the other people mentioned I'll move to um to defer this to a later meeting and have uh, discussions in the interim with the people involved in these projects second go ahead Second. we can do then just a roll call vote since there's no money actually spent um, all in favor, raise your hand. If you're not in favor, keep your hand down. All right, and that's unanimous. We can move forward to your staff report and the work days. Right, sorry, just getting these minutes here. Okay. All right, so um, staff report, uh, you know, we're still going strong with um, work days. I think on our off month, when I had sent you the stewardship report, um, that was when we first started the stewardship work days back up from when we had taken our hiatus. Um, and, you know, right now I'm also very lucky with the uptick of everything we're still going strong. We still got the green light um, with everything. And so we're really trying to pr promote Earth Month this month. Um, you know, now my schedule, I work every Saturday now. Um, I planned something every Saturday for uh, basically mid-March through May, um, just to kind of reach more people. Um, kind of touch on some more of the MCC programs because the invasive species strike team, the stewardship Saturdays are huge. I'm just trying to nurture some of those other programs a little more. We have a lot of individual volunteers with the cleanup crew um, picking up trash. So that's great. That's definitely a more individual program. Uh, it's perfect for COVID times. You know, people can just pick up supplies from me and go have fun. <laughs> and after you, Man Lee has showed me, um, the survey one, two, three, I'm so happy because now all of our data, data forms are going to be on an app or on a computer. So volunteers can also put all that data in when they're out in the field, how much you know trash they picked up. Um, so that's a really cool progression we're making. Um, but I did uh, schedule an Earth Day cleanup at Thai Heart Cornell Wetlands to kind of bring the the cleanup crew people together, the people who really like getting together on Saturdays. And also this was just an idea from one of our uh, deer hunters whose family actually, you know, owned part of that wetland a long time ago and he hunts out there now. And when he was hunting, he just found mattresses, just huge, crazy trash everywhere. So we kind of came up with the idea to do this around Earth Day. So we're really just trying to promote getting out getting out, pulling spring invasives. So, you know, garlic, mustard, and dame's rocket right now are a big one. And um, 
that's been really successful so far. We've got 12 people signed up so far for this Saturday, which is great. And most of the time people sign up pretty last minute. So um, we also started the Vernal Pool Patrol back up. You know, it, it was going on in Meridian Township, kind of fizzled out a little bit, but it's back, back at it again. And uh, <laughs> You man and her crew did some incredible virtual workshops that everyone just raved about at the training and all my volunteers have just loved everything by the way. So great job to you and your team. And we did a field, you know, a field training just with my group. Um, so I'm the, I'll be the local program coordinator. So the Vernal Pool Patrol is, is a statewide citizen science project, uh, an incredible program to collect data on vernal pools um, so that we can learn more about these awesome habitats. And so far we have 22 people signed up in Meridian Township who actually went through, there's three different trainings. <laughs> so it was really, you know, in depth uh, because they're very sensitive areas. So it was just really great for me. And I was just so impressed that that many people went through all those steps and we had to reschedule the first training because of, you know, me being sick. And then we had to reschedule another one for weather. So I would just, I'm just very impressed and happy that so many volunteers wanted to come out for that. Um, it, you man, if you want to say anything about the program, jump on in. No, I thought I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm really happy that so many people signed up and uh, actually, yeah, I did the training and I've been getting a, a lot of uh, contact, I mean, uh, emails about um, wanting hard copies of the manual, the materials and stuff that people from the local area. So yeah, it seems like there's a lot of, there's a lot of interest. It seems like everybody wants to monitor Vernal Pool at Lake Lansing. North. <laughs> so <laughs> some people I other places. <laughs> I know. And I, yeah. And I, I'm telling people with that that new mapping, you know, it's just so cool. You can see where all the, the potential pools are from looking at the map that was developed. And it's just incredible. And, and you know, volunteers can click on it. And they can see whether it's been, you know, verified or not. And then they can even get directions straight to that pool, you know, driving directions, walking directions. It's just, it makes my life a ton easier as a program coordinator. And I just I'm so happy about it. Yeah, I, but I feel the same. You know, a lot of them want to go to Lake Lansing North and uh, there's a lot more out there. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a, a really huge uh, success, a great program to launch this spring. The other thing that's been really successful this spring and I've been really happy about is the invasive species webinar I did back in January, and then the field training I did on the 13th, we had a full pack day for that. And uh, I've just been so busy because I've been having so many people reach out after those two events. And now I'm doing a lot of individual uh, invasive species trainings for different homeowners associations, like Ottawa Hills, Indian Hills. So I'm you know, going out to them or meeting at a, a specific place and you know, we're getting people out from those neighborhoods and educating them on invasive species, what they are. So when I do the trainings, I go over, there's like 15 common species that I deal with, you know, every day. And so we go over those and we talk about management, how to monitor, how to not get depressed and give up forever. <laughs> um, so it's just been really great with, with that. I'm glad there's a lot of that education getting getting out there. So all the programs are going well. We have Rebecca Fisher on board with us, which is gonna make my life uh, really much easier and more fun. And uh, looking forward to an awesome spring. Awesome. I think part of the staff report, we also, you wanted to briefly touch yes. on signage. We're gonna talk more about it next meeting, but we can get the well, brains working. Yes, and also just, I think we had mentioned, you know, improvements at Davis Foster, like the overlook and signage and things. So yeah, I want, you know, signage to be on everybody's radar. I've been looking at other preserves, preserve systems, you know, up north, 
what the Nature Conservancy does. You know, it's just, it's just kind of fun to see what everybody's doing. And um, this year is a big year for just preserve improvements in general. And so I put for our next meeting, I'd like to meet out at Davis Foster so we can kind of go over those overlook plans. We can kind of talk about location wise, what we're thinking. Um, I'm uh, prepping areas out there for seed bank gardens. So I thought it would just be a great first preserve to meet at because you know, we can kind of check out the recovery from the burn. We can talk about the overlook. We can just talk about some of the improvements that I want to start making at some of the preserves to enhance, um, you know, the the native um, the native species there, and and then signage. So, good things to think about for the preserves. Um, any comments from the public? I was just, so at the next meeting, would we be walking around or would, should we bring chairs to sit out there or what? Yeah, so we, in the past when we've met outside, we'll, you know, generally we, it happens where we can meet at a park that we can sit at and then go, you know, like last time we met at North Meridian Road and went to Foster Krause. But you know, in this case, because we're just going to be at a preserve, I think that would be a good idea if people are open to that, if we just wanna bring folding chairs and that way we can kind of go through the, the general meeting. So at these meetings, and, and of course this is, everything is always open to discussion on how we wanna um, conduct the meetings in the warm months. You know, if we really have a lot to talk about, we can change the format of the meeting. But what I kind of like, these meetings to look like is, you know, go through our general business. Um, but I want to start getting everyone out really, you know, because I, that's how I see all the issues and, and what we need to do and what we need to work on is just simply kind of walking those areas. And so, you know, in my mind, that's what I'm seeing, but I'm just, you know, that's just my two cents. So if people have a different format in mind, then I'm really open to whatever. It, it would be nice to make a decision about the overlook. Um, you know, we've been talking about it for years. <laughs> so that's what there, Jane said. <laughs> if, if, <laughs> that's what Jane said too. <laughs> so there's a way that we could get out there and say, hey, this group really thinks that this is the spot where it should be and it should be this big or, or whatever. Um, just if we could get off of that, that would be great. I mean, if that, that's the only thing that came out of that meeting, um, I'd be happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> great. Well, and I, that's why I thought Davis Foster would be good. Cause we can talk a ton about that. And I just know that there's different improvements that we've all, you know, kind of thought about out there. And, and I think that would, you know, that's something to think about for the future is, is meeting at preserves where we want to see things happen. And then we can just discuss it. We can see it right there. Um, and, and then hopefully, yeah, make a decision on that. So, so I'll bring all the, the plans to the next meeting and pictures, designs, you know, everything we need, and then we can go from there. I will say, Mark, my goal for this year is to have all of the overlook decisions at least done, and then we can figure out the spending the money next year. But um, that was one of the things I think was the first conversation we had when I first joined the board yeah. and nothing's changed. So that was like, yeah, um, oh, th that's going to be off our plate so we can focus on some other stuff and get, you know, other things done. Has anyone talked to anyone from Audubon or Bruce Cohen about that? Because I mean, in, in my mind, you might want to, like, I, he's a huge birder in the area. He goes out there a lot. And you might want to get, like, an opinion from, like, if it's supposed to be to view birds, you might want to, and I mean, we know him. I, we can talk to him if, you, if you'd like before the next meeting. Yeah, I mean, if you do want to contact him, I know that I I know Kelsey had 
been in contact with him about various things. I don't know specifically about the overlook. Um, but yeah, I, and I don't have a problem reach. I know the, the Autobahn person I know really well is Linnea Rousey. Um, she's the court, she's the coordinator in this area. So she's usually the one I talk to about birding stuff, but I'd be really happy yeah, to if, also chat with Bruce. But I, I, if you already have a contact, that's fine. I just. It's a good partnership. It would be a good partnership. We might be able to get, you know, something from them either financially or maybe, uh, you know, spotting scope that is permanent or, you know, some kind of thing that's not going to be vandalized, you know, they might have ideas on that kind of thing or um, yeah absolutely so they, they might be a good partner for that or some yeah, maybe, I, maybe some I, interpretation as well you know they may be very interested in doing some signage or, or something like that that would help us along the way yeah i can talk to them before the next meeting and at least see what they have to say i know and i now contact linnea i mean Hey, I, I feel like there's never enough people you can get input from um, different experts. So yeah, I think that would be great. I know Kelsey did have plans for a, um, a little telescope binocular station and uh, some sci interpretive signage for birding. I think that would be great. And Jamie, I think that's great to get everything on the docket. I mean, I created that 10 year plan and I want to add to it. I want to add as many specifics as possible. So if we can get that those sort of things on the docket and we can decide, okay, we're going to do this year two, year three, year four um, and spread out the funds that way. Um, I'm all about the action part of it and getting it, getting it done. So yeah. we've definitely, the beginning was very much focused on acquisition of property mm -hmm. but now that we have stuff it's um, time to start switching that focus and really putting that money into the, the properties we have and um, you know having some of these promises we've made on the properties get accomplished that way hopefully 10 years from now when we do another millage people think that it's worthwhile and we don't have to cut it again and we can keep going yeah let's spend some of that money <laughs> um i was also going to say for the individuals um the audubon society our meetings are open to the public if they actually wanted to to come to the meetings you know they are welcome to to join in and maybe be able to provide some insight in person that's a great idea okay any other comments from public or matters from other board members The you only have question, no members of the public here, so I I do have a question about um, the the pike spawning. Have you been contacted at all by the guys from the DNR? Either no, no. I'm. It sounds with Joe. like you haven't either. Yeah, neither have I. Joe and Brian. I don't know if they've done it on their own. Went out there and checked it out, and we're going to give recommendations to us. But this is the time of the year to maybe encourage them to do that again. And I'll send both of those guys a note um, and uh, go from there. But that's I can another, tell you, sounds good. another thing, Jamie, that we've had on our plate forever. So. I can tell you they probably haven't been out. That um, railroad crossing has actually been under construction for the last few weeks because I live like 50 feet away from it. Oh. Um, so that whole area has been pretty much shut down. It's just opened back up. So they probably haven't been out there maybe in the last like three okay. weeks ish. Yeah. And I hate to say it too, cause I'm kind of in the mode right now where there's so much going on that I, you know, they haven't reached out to me and so I haven't yeah. reached out to them either, <laughs> but yeah. yeah. It's a busy, busy season for everyone. There's not a lot of water now, so there, yeah. uh, there may not be big water out there. So, All I right. know Okemos Road hasn't even flooded yet this year. Knocking on wood. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, I do want to say, um, I just wanted to say that, uh, you know. Um, looking at the flyers and everything for the MCC and all the all the work days and all that you've got planned and stuff. I mean, it's 
phenomenal. I mean, it all looks great, you know, so good, just kudos and great job, Thanks. Emma. <laughs> Thank you so much. I really Very appreciate good. that. I've got my MCC shirt. I tie-dyed it. <laughs> I got a I little tie-dye crazy. Yeah, no, I, and I want to say that too. I gave Steve some, some swag, but board members, you're absolutely, you know, anything is game for you guys. T-shirt, hat, put it on, wear it around town. I've got all of that at the service center center. So let me know if you want anything, let me know sizes and I can always put stuff out on the table or wherever and you can pick it up. So or I can bring it to the next field meeting. So I will put that in the minutes to remind, remind um, myself. <laughs> I will say too, I was actually contacted by the Hazlitt Middle School Conservation Club um, asking about the MCC and how to get involved with the preserves. So I gave them the email address and things. So you might be getting contacted um, by the middle school club perfect probably Thank in the fall so when much. things are less covid -y. um right, right but they really want to be able to get involved and i really appreciate what you've been doing that's awesome ben thank Panetta. you <laughs> yep yeah, he's, he's awesome. he'll get his kids working hard so yeah it's good yeah thanks for passing on the information you know thanks to anyone who's who's been doing that so i appreciate that it's growing every day we've got the past two weeks, 35 people signed up. So nice. it's good. It's a nice steady flow of people. <laughs> Great. If there is nothing else, next announcement, the meeting will be on Wednesday, May 12th at 6 p.m. at Davis Foster Preserve. Um, maybe we should also review what the actual name is for that preserve as well but that yeah, can be we're, later discussion yeah we're still figuring that out because everyone is severely confused and we need to change quite a few things depending on which way we go so so far what i have figured out is that there is no name tied to it necessarily that there's no specific name that has to be um tied you know to the preserve except for, um, I think, Davis. And then, you know, Jane is not really sure where the sign came, came from that's at the preserve. Because they've, uh, she's, you know, she said, I've always referred to it as Davis Foster. It's how we have all of our files marked. It's how it is on the website. So I, kind, I know that, Chris, we talked about it being a, a nice neighborhood thing. But I, you know, it does kind of sound like they just want to switch the sign at the preserve. But that is definitely you know something we can talk about it is an attached sign so it's not permanently on the big sign um i think everyone's just a little confused about that so well um does anyone want to then make a motion to adjourn i don't think we have to take such such action go ahead I'll second that. Time is at 8.20. 8.20 PM. And then Mark seconded. All right, thank you everyone so much for a great meeting. Uh, thanks for the kudos, I really appreciate it. And uh, I hope everyone has a great rest of their April. <laughs> it's going quick, so get out there and enjoy it. <laughs>